All right. Howdy and welcome to the show. Glad to have you with us. Big show here. This is Mr. Gary Wolf, and we're so honored and privileged to have him here with us today. And uh, he's going to tell us some really cool stuff. So what are we going to go over today, Mr. Wolf? Well, we're going to talk about the different types of freight car trucks, how they behave, what you measure on a truck, how you look for performance issues. Mm. And there's uh, three or four truck styles here from a barber. We have a ride control, I think. We have a ride master, and I think we have a motion control. Motion control. Okay, so... Those are different manufacturers of the trucks or truck sets or as right. our... our uh, now, yeah. here's a question I have. Before you get started, in the United Kingdom and Australia and stuff, they're called bogies. That's right. Does Europeans, these... Uh, call these bogies, we call them trucks. And uh, does, does the same manufacturers make for bogies as they do in the United States? Well, uh, there's licensing arrangements. Like in Australia, there's a company called Brad Ken that I think uses the patents and, and uh, rights to either barber or ride control. Okay, got that. And so the freight car truck is universal around the world. This three-piece truck you will be found in Asia, Africa, South America, Australia, U.S., Russia, Europe. These three-piece trucks are ubiquitous, they're everywhere, because it's a, probably goes down as one of mankind's greatest inventions next to the <laughs> wheel and fire. This thing nice. is such a marvelous piece of equipment, highly refined. To be able to let these wheels go across any kind of track, any gauge, with uh, low joints, high joints, soft spots, and equalize the loads into mm -hmm. the wheels and the cars. It's a marvelous tool. Yes, we it is. We call it a three-piece truck because it has a side frame over here, about six feet long, a side frame over there, and the bolster across is the third piece. Mm -hmm. And these are independent components cast at various foundries. You may find that the side frames were cast in Grand City, Illinois, and the bolster might have been cast in Elias, Ohio, or maybe even India or Pakistan or Mexico, uh, wherever foundries are located today. It's become somewhat of a global market. And so when you build a freight car at the factory, you don't order trucks. You order the components and you build the trucks yourself. You order the That's frames, interesting. the bolsters, the wheels, the brake beams, the springs, and bearing adapters, you put all this together uh -huh. from scratch, so to speak, like a kit. Uh -huh. but, but you don't order, call up and say, I want 100 trucks. It just doesn't happen. You order the components. Speaking of 100, I, I don't know if you're going to get to these. Are, these are 100-ton trucks. Yes, sir. 100-ton trucks. Which and means that the wheelbase dimension from the center of this axle to the center of this axle is, is exactly 70 inches. Mm -hmm. And I think Dave has another excellent video on, on the buttons here. The pairing buttons. There'll be a link in this video's description to go watch that. Yeah, these three All about buttons pairing buttons. Indicate that we, the side frame is precisely 70 inches long, axle center to axle center. If it was shorter than 70, you might have one or two buttons. If it was longer by a few 30 seconds, you might have four or five buttons. Mm -hmm. When you build a truck... You must match these buttons either precisely or we allow one button offset plus or minus. So that's the side frame. Also, I'll point out all side frames have a pattern number here, which is given from the, uh, I think AAR assigns these. This is F9S06DNUA. And that is important. You know, when you build a truck that you get the same pattern number on all your side frames. Cool. Also, the bolsters have a pattern number that's a little harder to read in there. Maybe, I think it's more visible on the other side, Dave. All right. And there's also a master chart that says what side frames can go with what bolsters. Because wow. you don't want to build an incorrect truck. So that's all kept on some master sheets. Now... Mm -hmm. What I want to do is start here where all the action occurs in a freight car truck. And I'm going to get down here on the ground. You can get down here with me. Uh, okay. Here's our suspension springs. And they come in different sizes from D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, and D7 spring sizes. 
and different sizes or different diameters and different free heights and different stiffnesses. And when we use the term stiffness, we mean how much deflection, uh, how many pounds of force does it take to deflect the spring, say one inch, like 4,000 pounds per inch or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the designer of the truck will pick the right springs to provide the right suspension. Now this is called secondary suspension. On the other video we talked about locomotives have suspension between the wheels and the frame. We don't have it on freight cars. It's steel on steel through the bearing adapter. But this is... This is your uh, bearing adapter. Yes, sir. Pipe. Right here. This part. So we have... There's also wear marks on there too, right? Right. I can talk about that in a minute. Sorry to interrupt you, no sir. No problem. So, um, where was I? Oh, this is a secondary suspension that isolates the frame down here to the bolster here, which the car body rides on this part through the center bowl over here. Now, back here, Dave, if you can see it, are things called friction wedges right here. All right. There and over here. Now, these wedges move up and down in a bolster pocket, creating friction between the, the wedge and the side frame column right here, the column wear plate. Mm -hmm. And that wedge acts as the shock absorber for the freight car. Just like on your automobile, you have a hydraulic shock absorber. The problem is we those are expensive and they're a maintenance headache. And the railroad designers have turned to dry friction to dampen out the road shocks. You see a spring down so. here will only absorb energy. It doesn't dissipate it. And the same on your automobile. If you only had springs in your car, you would have a very bouncy ride going down the highway. So you put a shock absorber in there to take the energy out of the springs and dissipate it and change it into heat energy. Wow, that's, that's cool what stuff. We do here with friction wedges, take the up and down motion out of the springs and that creates friction here that turns the mechanical kinetic energy into heat energy and dissipates it to atmosphere. So it's a very simple system, very reliable. Uh, wedges can last 500,000 miles or more before they need changing, but they do wear down and that results in something we call wedge rise. And you measure wedge rise from the top of the bolster here to the top of the wedge shoulder right here. And on most barber trucks, you can have no more than three quarters of an inch of wedge rise. That would be the, mm -hmm. the rise of the, of the wedge in the pocket. When the uh, car body unloads. Well, that would, yeah, well, yes. That's when the bolster would come up. That's right. That's right. So. So it's up now. Yeah. There's no we weight put, on it. If we put weight on this, it would squish this down mm -hmm. a few inches and the wedges would be more visible in, yeah. in, in the pocket here. So, that's the business end of the freight car truck. Here's your secondary suspension to cushion your road shocks. These are the wedges, the shock absorbers to take the energy out of the springs and to restore your ride quality back to a stable, smooth ride. Nice. Now, out here okay, this is out of Mr. Wolf's book here. And uh, maybe an illustration because you can't see in there on those truck sets that we have. This is the wedge that he's talking about. Maybe a better picture is over here. Okay, and uh, this is the wedge rise. So I think you get a better picture. Now you can uh, get a better picture of uh, what that actually looks like in there. How about that? And uh, see where the wear occurs on the various surfaces. All right. Okay. Nice. Now, out here on the ends of the bolster, right here we have these ears called gibs, G-I-B-S. And the gibs are basically door stops. And they're there to prevent excessive lateral motion. And Dave, if you could come over here. Yes, sir. Look on the back side. There's a gib called the inner gib right here. Okay, this thing here. 
-hmm. and there's one on the outside over here. Yeah. Now, those two things, those two gibs, are there to prevent the bolster from sliding sideways. So they're basically door stops and really don't have much function in life other than in some extreme case. But now, that would be very important. Yeah. If that wasn't stopped. Right. Oh yeah, you could come apart. So the AR says you should have no more than inch and a half total gib clearance. So you measure the clearance here, it looks like about three eighths of an inch. You measure the clearance out here, it looks like about three quarters to an inch. And that does not exceed inch and a half. So your gib wear yes. is within limits. But when this truck set goes down track, it will, that bolster will move back and forth a small amount, right? It can, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. We don't want it to. And see, like on these gibs, if you come back around here, these these are new trucks, aren't they? Are rebuilt ones? They're not worn. They don't look too worn. Yes, they are. Okay, there. So, yes, it is rebuilt. See, if you start to see wear behind the gibs where these things are touching, mm -hmm. that means the truck is either hunting at high speed, or warping oh. at low speed, or maybe harmonically rocking. We don't have any hunting at high speeds. You should not here, <laughs> but you might get rock and roll that will start uh, uh, contact here. So mm -hmm. if you start to see shiny marks here, indicating these gibs are touching at some point when the car is going down the track, that's a sign you may have high wedge rise, uh, you may have bad springs. I didn't mention this. Also, the thing about barber trucks, this is a barber truck design, is it's called variable damp truck. This is important. Because the springs under the wedge, if you can see down in here, this spring called the control spring under the wedge right here, acts in tandem with these load springs here. Mm -hmm. And so when the car is loaded with coal, all these springs squish down, this one and that one, included and your damping force and friction force goes up then when you dump the coal the springs will come up an inch or so and the control spring will come up and reduce the force and reduce the friction so on the barber system because it's variably damped it means when it's loaded you get more friction more damping and when it's empty you get less so it's it kind of tunes itself to the load in the freight car. Nice. And a lot of people that ship commodities like coal and grain, iron ore, frac sand, they like variable damping. Mm -hmm. it gives you more when the car is loaded when you need it. Okay. So they have the variable damp trucks and constant damp. Constant damp. We'll get damped. to that okay. as we move down the line here. All right. Now another element I want to point out is the side bearing element. Now this is a a round side bearing. This is kind of worn. Kind of okay. worn. This is an elastomeric element, and uh, there is something called a free height measurement, or minimum height from here to the bottom. I don't know what it is offhand, but the purpose of the constant contact side bearing is to control truck hunting at high speeds. Now that's not a problem here at Cumberland, but on freight car trucks that go out and run 50 or 60 miles an hour, these are very important. And originally, when constant contact side bearings were first invented back in the 60s and 70s, these elements uh, rode directly in the cage and touched the car body here. But the elements would get cracked and broken, like mm -hmm. you see right here. And so they came up with, in the 1980s, a metal cap version. And this metal cap uh, lasts a lot longer and preserves the life, allegedly, of the elements. But you can see these elements do take a beating. They get hot when the truck is hunting. They'll start to melt, like you see a little bit of melting here, perhaps. Yeah. So We need to take, leave that out. We need to replace that one. Well, and this is the metal cap that fits over on top. Now, the key element in a freight car truck is that you must maintain the uh, setup height of this element, the top of this element to the top of bolster here at normally five to five and a sixteenth of an inch. If this dimension is five to five and a sixteenth of an inch, you'll have the right amount of tension or preload compression on that bearing block to control truck hunting, but not too much that it stops the truck from curving, uh, curving properly. 
Hmm. And when this dimension gets below about four and seven eighths of an inch, this setup height, the truck will have resistance to turning in a curve or switch, it might spread gauge, it might result in wheel climb. This is a very important measurement to always check at all four corners of your freight car, called the side bearing setup height. Nice. Now, I'm not gonna step in the puddle there, but this is the center bolt. 16 inches in diameter, nominally two inches deep. And this is where the car body rests, called the body center plate, sits in there on the freight car. Now we call it a center bolt. In Europe, they call it a center bearing. And I think that has a better name because when you think of a bearing, you think of what? Lubrication, right? When you think of a bowl, what do you think of? Cereal. Cereal, <laughs> ice cream, dog food. So we call it a bowl, and a lot of people don't get the idea it needs lubrication. But this is where all the turning of the car occurs, right in this center plate and center bowl region. So it must be kept lubricated by AAR standards whenever the car is on a repair track and you lift the car body up for any reason, you must insert lubricant in there. And that may only occur every five, six, seven years, who knows, but it's a requirement to lubricate. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I was going to mention is if there's ever shiny wear marks around the edge of this bowl, it means you've worn too far down. And the center plate now is contacting the bowl rim. And that also tends to lock up the truck or, or, or affect the, the effect of steering or turning of the truck on the car body. Because in a curve, this whole truck must turn back and forth, left, right, left, right, etc. And so you don't ever want to see shiny marks around the bowl rim indicating a, a, uh, a contacting going on. Down here we have our brake beam. And this strut is what applies the brake shoe force right here to the wheel tread to stop the train when you want to use air brakes. And uh, this, there's various kinds of rigging. There's bottom under, there's rod through. Uh, but these uh, brake uh, levers here link up to uh, long rods from the brake cylinder on the car. And you gain leverage by virtue of your moment arm difference between the pin here and there versus the pin there and there, you can get your brake shoe force up to two, three thousand pounds per shoe, whatever is required uh, to stop the train when you have to. The danger of brake shoes is sometimes they break right in here because of the forces. They'll break around the uh, back here of the head and then this brake head might fall out or get under a wheel and derail the train. So that's a, a thing we also check for is any cracks in the brake beam here. So awesome. This is the barber truck. Um, very common truck. I'd say 40% maybe of all freight cars, just rough estimate, uh, today may have barber trucks on them. Very, very popular truck, very common truck. We have most of ours are barber. Okay. I would say it's probably about roughly that percentage too. And they what make, we have uh, several versions of the barber. There's the S2C, the S2E, the S2D, the S2HD for heavy duty. Um, so barber is again a very popular. Barber is now owned by the uh, WebTech company. Bought the rights to Barber from Standard Car Truck. Did not know that. Barber is the, I think, the, the man that patented the first Barber trucks. And then Standard Car Truck was a distributor for many, many years. Very good company. And then Webtech uh, bought them years ago. So, cool. That's that one. Okay. Well, this is Mr. Wolf's book, The Complete Field Guide to Modern Derailment Investigation. It's over 430 pages of. Uh, Railroad information on all kinds of stuff. Uh, this is a, an, over a thousand different uh, photos. So I highly recommend this for all railroaders and for all train fans. It's uh, just chock full of information. There's a link in this video's description. Uh, to go to Mr. Wolf's website where you can order your copy of this book.